Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Joe Chappelle, and you're listening to episode 48 of the OBGYN podcast. This is the Journal Club for November 2018, and joining me today, I have two minimally invasive experts with me, and that's Dr. Jen Blaber and Julie Leanne. Welcome. Thank you for having Happy me to back. Be here. Before we get started today, uh, I just want to thank everyone who has decided to contribute to the show through the Patreon, um, and I ask anyone who hasn't to please consider. In addition to helping defray the costs of running the podcast and the website, your contributions will help us start getting these episodes transcribed and uploaded to the website, which is something that people have been asking for since the very beginning of the show, and it's something I've always wanted to do, but so far it's been you know prohibitively expensive. So please go over to the website, www.obgn.fm, and click on the support button if you, if you can. Um, with that out of the way, let's get started with today's article. Um, it's going to be a little interesting today. We're doing the Minimally Invasive versus Abdominal Radical Hysterectomy for Cervical Cancer, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on October 31st, 2018, so very recently. It was uh, written by Pedro Ramirez and his large group of uh, contributors. And it was done by the group at MD Anderson, amongst others. So before we get into the paper, I think that what is attractive to the three of us talking about this paper is that really the world of GYN and then oncology has really been overtaken by laparoscopy and robotic surgery in the last decade. Um, We have seen a huge rise in the number of cases, especially in robotics, that have come along. And I don't think that a lot of people have stopped and asked the question, is this good for our patients? It's a new technology. It has some what seems like intuitive benefits, but we don't really have a lot of data to say it's absolutely better. So before we even get into the paper, I kind of want to think, I want to ask the two of you what your thoughts are on this rise of laparoscopy and robotic surgery and its effect on gynecology. And why don't we start with you, Dr. Blaber? You know, I I almost feel like I desperately want minimally invasive surgery to be, you know, the best thing out there for women. Like, I want the evidence to show that this is the way women should receive care. When I first saw this article came out, I feel like it was almost like a punch in the gut. Another MIS technique was under attack. Uh, You know, women um, were going to be left with only open surgery for not just fibroids because of morselation, but now cervical cancer. And for me, I was really disappointed when I first saw it. But you're right. We really do need to seek out what is best per the evidence. And if evidence-based medicine doesn't support our techniques, then even if it is disappointing, Um, I completely agree. I mean, being uh, MIS trained, I have to say I am biased towards favoring the laparoscopic and uh, robotic approaches to surgeries. Um, And, um, you know, reading this article, it was also a huge shock for me because um, as a resident, uh, I've definitely, you know, seen both um, approaches, the open and the robotic approach for cervical cancer. And, um, you know, it's it's surprising and shocking to read that um, this article sh- is um, showing that the um, benefits um, of uh, minimally invasive surgery don't outweigh the risks, um, at least for treatment of cervical cancer. Yeah, I think what both of you said is completely accurate. Uh, you know, I was also one of the early adopters, I guess, for MIS. I I should say early because it was already being adopted by the time I was in training, but I certainly helped push that forward, and I use it in my own practice. Um, But I think one of the things we're going to get into later is even if we really feel that MIS has something to contribute to women's uh, care, whether it be in fibroid surgery, and I think fibroid surgery is is a very interesting... um, anecdote in this whole thing, we can talk about that more, is that maybe it fundamentally is good, but our technique is what has to improve. Or maybe even even technology too, you know, we don't really truly understand, um, you know, how, how, how the technology can affect outcomes truly. So I think this article also highlights that. Absolutely. So I, and I don't think it means that we should abandon everything that we're doing, um, but I definitely means that we should be a little more introspective about about our technology and not just blindly adopt it, which is something that, by the way, that humans are really good at. 
Um, so it's not just an MIS. We're just good at adopting technologies without proof they're better uh, in all fields. Um, but let's get into the paper. So we're going to talk about the methods first. The, they did a randomized controlled trial, a non-inferiority study, which is important for this. And their primary outcome was uh, disease-free survival at four and a half, five years. Four and a half years, which is a weird kind of number, but I think it comes from literature, so that's fine. Uh, their secondary outcomes were recurrence rate and then overall survival. So getting into their inclusion-exclusion criteria, some of this stuff is interesting to me. Um, I don't think it ends up mattering, but they included squamous cell carcinoma, adenosquamous carcinoma, and adenocarcinoma. And I thought that was interesting they added, they included all three of those because they're very, I mean, they're all cancers of the cervix, but they're very different cancers of the cervix that behave differently, that are some are more aggressive or less aggressive. So I thought it was interesting that they included um, all three of those together in one study. Yeah, I really felt that they maybe should have focused on squamous cell carcinoma because it is the most common. Um, but, you know, then again, I'm not an oncologist, so maybe there's a good reason why they were all included together. But it just seemed a little strange to me. Um, and then as far as staging, I don't think there's anything too surprising here. They included 1A1, 1A2, and 1B1. And just for the people who are not um, oncologists, I looked this up myself um, before we did the study today. But 1A1 is lymphovascular invasion. 1A2 is a stromal invasion, 3 to 5 millimeters with less than 7 millimeters in width. And 1B1 is less than 4 centimeters in greatest dimension and no nodular involvement. Uh, and then I believe 1B2 is a visible lesion. So it's basically it's all these microscopic uh, cervical cancers. And those are the ones that are usually treated with radical hysterectomy. So it's no surprise that these are the ones that they included. So, um, And then some of the interesting things that they did here. They included 33 sites. Um, and this is where I want to ask the, the two of you some questions. Um, each site had to do at least 10 minimally invasive cases uh, in order to be uh, a site. So it couldn't be something that like one person was doing a few a year. So that was interesting. And they also, each site had to submit video of themselves doing a minimally invasive rad hiss that was reviewed by the people at MD Anderson, I'm assuming, to make sure that everyone was doing at least a similar rad hiss. Um, and um, we can get into the rest of the paper, but I think that part right there is a good model for us in doing our MIS research. Um, I don't know, what, how did that strike you, Dr. Leanne? What do you think? I think that was very, very good of them to um, include that because, um, as they pointed out, the expertise of the surgeon can definitely affect outcomes, especially for um, cancer um, treatments. So I think that was very smart of them to do that. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I mean, I think that I'm a big proponent of um, you know, regulation of surgical privileges. And so that... Yeah. I mean, I can even they think in this paper, doing it in robotic cases, robotic myomectomies, where you're looking at blood loss or length of uh, time of surgery or all these other outcomes that we look for in those robotic cases, uh, you know, just watching someone do a hysterectomy is much different than looking at their raw numbers at the end of it. Um, why did it take them two hours versus one hour or four hours, right? I mean, we have all seen cases that we think that we could do shorter. And I've actually seen cases where I looked at someone do the case and I say, that would take me four hours and it took them an hour and a half. Right. Um, and so the surgeon's skill definitely matters for all of this. And the only way you can really evaluate that is by watching someone operate. And that takes some part of the confounding out of it, too. So, Yeah. And, and that is one of the major things. And, and we'll get into laparoscopy versus robotic in a second. But even that's an, another issue. Um, so I, I like that they did a randomized non-inferiority trial, like I said. There was a great paper. I believe it was in... I think actually in the Green Journal, uh, either last month or the month before, is a little editorial about what a non-inferiority trial is and how to interpret it. And so I, I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. I'd encourage everyone to go read it. It's like a page and a half. And it's just a, it's a nice, clear, concise, brilliant description of how to interpret these trials because they are a little different. So what they were looking for was an 8% difference. So what that means is that any difference between the two groups that was less than 8% would be considered to be non-inferior or that they were both the same, essentially. Any difference greater than 8% would be considered to be non would be considered to be inferior, one or the other, and there would be a difference there. Um, they chose that 8% because that was chosen, that was used in other papers 
Um, it's kind of an odd number, um, but it was from literature. So that's why that, that was chosen. This paper ended up being stopped uh, a little early. Um, they did calculate a power analysis of 740 uh, in the two groups. So women were randomized after they were diagnosed with their cervical cancer to either a MIS or an open. And um, when they, I'm assuming what happened is that somebody noticed or kind of uh, anecdotally noticed that there were more deaths in one group than the other and decided to do a, um, you know, a stop and look at the data before they continued. It was the Data and Safety Monitoring Committee that noticed that there was an increased number or an imbalance in the and number so of deaths. We've actually talked about other papers the where they build in a stop at 50%. And they look at the data then and then go forward. That doesn't seem to be what happened here. It seemed to be that, the, like you said, the safety committee um, noticed that there was a difference and decided to stop the trial and look at the data. So uh, that was interesting. Um, what I always find interesting about these kind of interventional trials is when you randomize someone to so, so different surgeries from either MIS or open, how many women actually stick with that randomization, right? Because... I definitely, we definitely know women uh, or anybody who when said, you know, you're going to have this or this, they say, okay, sure, I'll be in the study. And then they get the, the other one. They'll say, you know what? I don't really want to do that. I actually would rather have the MIS surgery or, or the open for whatever reason. So they had of the 631 that were uh, enrolled in the study, 68 um, did not uh, get their assigned surgery. So that's about 10%. 31 withdrew. 27 of the surgeries were aborted. And then only 10 actually switched surgical type, which I thought was a relatively low number for this kind of study. I was impressed by that. Now, one thing I'll say, and that, you know, all of us have done um, you know, resident rotations in oncology, even though we don't practice now, is that for some reason, women with cancer seem to be more amenable to trials like this. Um, you know, we enrolled basically every woman at Stony Brook who had cancer in some kind of trial. Um, and I can maybe count on one hand the number of women who declined to participate in a trial. So I think there's something inherently different about these women than, than others. Um, before I get into some results, um, anything in their methods that you thought you would have done differently, that you thought were a little odd, or um, were you generally happy with it? Um, I was generally happy with it. I mean, I I was also surprised that they had... Um, only 10 patients who switched before their surgery to, um, to the other, um, modalities. So, um, yeah, I was, I was pretty happy with their method. Okay. So a couple of things I wanted to talk about, about the non-inferiority, um, part of this. So when you're designing a study like this, I think most people would expect it to be designed as your traditional is one of these better than the other. Um, the reason you know you choose a non inferiority uh, is because you uh, this is not going to come out the way I want it to sound, but you want to be able to enroll less people so so when you 're doing a non inferiority generally you need less people in that study to prove that there 's not a difference as opposed to proving that one is better than the other and if you wanted to prove a difference here, you would have had to enroll a lot more women in order to prove that. Right, um, and that is one of the benefits of non inferiority. Now, it also helps if you have a gold standard, which is, I guess, open uh, surgery. Here, you want to at least prove that your new version is not any worse than that, right? Because that other it does have benefits, right? I mean, we all three of us know what the benefits of minimally invasive surgery are, right? Faster recovery, usually longer operative times, but faster recovery, less pain, right? Right, so there are benefits of doing less minimally invasive surgery, loss. and in fact. You can make an argument for this kind of surgery that the, especially in robotics, that the visualization you get is so superior to an open surgery that you would almost intuit that the outcomes would be better, right? Right, Because your visualization is so much better. You can get so much more lateral, like all those things, right? Um, But if you're going to do that, you want to at least make sure that it's not any worse than what the gold standard is. Um, And I think that's where this trial came from. And I think it was kind of a brilliant choice to do it as a non-inferiority versus your standard um, you know, prospective randomized trial. I mean, I think logically they had to do it like this as well, because if you think about the numbers for this study, they needed 33 centers doing 10 or more surgeries. And this is worldwide too, not just the U S yeah. So think about 
how I don't think they could have gotten the numbers to do an RCT straightforward with this study. I agree. I mean, how many rad hits did we do at Stony Brook a year? A handful. We couldn't have been a handful. Center. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, we happen to be a little bit handicapped by the fact that we're 60 miles from, you know, one of the uh, epicenters of uh, GYN oncology in the world. Um, so, you know, women tend, tend to naturally gravitate towards there. Um, but still, I mean, we are the major oncology center for a population of 1 million women, or 1 million people, not women, but 1 million people right here in Suffolk County. And yet uh, we only do a handful a year, right? So you're really talking like, you know, uh, tertiary, quaternary care centers who are, who are doing this. Which also speaks to the surgical uh, expertise. Mm -hmm. All right, so to go into some of the data uh, in the laparoscopic group, 84.4% were laparoscopic and 15.6% were robotic. Um, and if I have any quibbles with the study, it's probably going to come, come down to that breakdown. Uh, interestingly, only 3.5% of the cases were converted which I thought was a very, very low number um, and I was kind of impressed by. And again, probably speaks to the skills of the surgeons. Um, but maybe also speaks to the fact that maybe more of them should have been converted. And if they did, maybe the outcomes would have been better. You know, it's hard to say. But I did think that as well. Um, going into their baseline characteristics, um, there were no differences uh, in the two groups. So I know I talked about adenocarcinoma and adenosquamous carcinoma, but they were equal in, in both the groups. Uh, the stage was the same in both the groups. Uh, obviously, the length of stay in the hospital was higher for the open versus the minimally invasive, but that's to be expected. Um, and age, BMI, um, all the same. So they made it as, as equal as you could. So a lot of my concerns mm -hmm. from that part um, don't really hold. Then going into the, I guess, the things that we were really interested in, and that is, uh, one, to start with the intraoperative complications, which were not that high. So 11% versus 10.5%, mm -hmm. no, no difference. The early post-operative complications were 25% uh, basically in each group. So again, it didn't really matter as far as your complication rate, whether you had um, either kind of surgery. But then we get into what we were talking about earlier, and that is the survival. And here's where, I mean, these, these numbers are stunning, right? Yeah. Um, so the five-year survival, four-and-a-half-year survival, although the median um, time to survival here or, or inclusion in the study was only two-and-a-half years because they cut the study short. But there was 86% in the MAS group and 95.6% in the open group. I mean, that's a 10% difference. Um, but it's a drastic number. I mean, it's really, it's really impressive. Um, looking at recurrence, not even just in, um, in disease to survival there, but 27% of the MIS group had recurrence and 7 um, in the open. So that's 20, 20 women there. It's huge. It's huge. It's a huge number. Um, right. And I thought that there was some interesting things as far as where they recurred, and I, and I don't have an explanation for it, and I don't think they have an explanation for it, uh, although there are some theories here, but 43% of the vaginal vault recurrences uh, happened in the open group, and interestingly, all of the non-vault recurrences happened in the MAS group, and that's just, that's just weird. Like, why are these non-vault recurrences happening in the MAS group? And we'll talk about that in one minute, and I promise I'm going to stop talking in a second and, and ask you guys what you think. Um, and then the last thing is the deaths. So there were 19 deaths in the MIS group and only three in the open group. Um, and so, I mean, I know we just ran through this study, um, and there's a little bit, little bit more nuance in here. But really, it's such a well-designed study that was written very well that it was easy just to talk through the results. But I would encourage you all to go, to go read it. So let's stop there, uh, and we'll get to the discussion in a second. But... What did you guys think when you first read these numbers, and and you know what do you think it means to you, Doctor Blaber? I mean, it's really shocking. Like the the numbers are huge. I when I first saw the title of this paper, and it uh, caught my eye, and I was reading this paper, I actually never expected to see such a huge difference in the numbers. I thought it was going to be a positive study based on the way it was written, but never expected these numbers at all. Yeah, I mean, they really did bury the lead in the title. Right. But I think the authors were also surprised, too, because their hypothesis was that it was not inferior to the open uh, approach. So um, I think I think everyone is everyone's surprised. 
Yeah, I mean, I bet you if you asked them in their heart of hearts, they would have told you that they thought it was better. Yeah. Not just not inferior. I mean, these are some kick-ass surgeons. Right. Go back to that number that you spoke about, about the breakdown between laparoscopic mm-hmm. radical hysterectomies and robotics. The majority of the cases in this right. study were done right. laparoscopically. Right. That alone says that you're dealing with a group of people for whom MIS is like their thing. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, watching anybody do a, I've seen people do a robotic radical hysterectomy and thinking about someone doing that laparoscopically is almost unfathomable to me. Yeah, I've never, I've never seen the one live. And I, I mean, I've never for seen me, that was like, wow, these people can really operate. I, I mean, they must have thought the same thing I thought that that was going to be the better way to do this. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I do want to ask you a question about that. I mean, having seen robotic surgery in general, and I, like I said, I've seen uh, a couple of robotic radical hysterectomies, do you think that the numbers would have been different if they were all robotic versus laparoscopic? Do you think there's something inherently better about robot for this surgery? I know, I know with the caveat that none of us actually do radical hysterectomies, but we do do MIS. I'm not sure if they would have had a different result because... Um... You know, besides the robot and the increased dexterity and potentially better visualization, the mechanics of it are still the same. You're still using um, uh, CO2 insufflation. You're still using the, uh, the manipulator. So I personally don't know if, if you had more proportion of robotic cases that that would have made a difference in the results. I don't know. It definitely caught my eye, That's to, that, you know, that fact of the paper. I, I definitely thought about that when I was reading the paper and... I wonder, I think, you know, at some point when I read this paper, I think, is the visualization with laparoscopic or even robotic surgery just that much better that you're getting that much closer of a dissection? And is is there such a thing as taking too much? And, Mm. And is that contributing to the, you know, the data here? Because with the robotics, at least, you know, you definitely have a, you know, almost like a 3D view, right? And with laparoscopic surgery, even you have a better view than you do open. And are you just dissecting too much? And is, is that really a concern here? One of the main differences I kind of thought between doing an open and a laparoscopic or robotic is your uh, energy use. So in open, you're mostly doing a, you know, clamp and tie there's probably not too many of these surgeons who are doing a ligature hist for for robotic, I mean, for a uh, radical hysterectomy. So, and then in robotic and laparoscopic, um, I want to say obviously, but people people who don't do it, um, but obviously you're using an energy source. You're not clamping and tying, so you're either using a uh, energy, you know, a straight energy source, or you're using a a, a supersonic like a harmonic. But either case, you're using heat. And is there more lymphovascular spread with that kind of um, overheating of the tissue as opposed to just cutting it and tying it. That was the only thing I thought that maybe um, I could think that was different. And I know they have a couple um, ideas as well. I don't know, what do you guys think about the energy source as a, maybe a, a potential issue here? It's definitely possible uh, as a contributing factor. They really didn't mention anything about it, though. That is something we don't know about the laparoscopic and robotic cases. You know, we don't know what types of energy were being used. And so we don't know if the spread is uniform. Um, were, were they all using the same devices or not? And, and then that could add more confounding to the minimally invasive cases for sure. Yeah, I just wonder if like the, the bipolar especially with the way it coagulates, is it like forcing the lymph especially through like into the surrounding tissue as it seals i don't know it, it may just be bs but i don't know that like what else is different really about the two surgeries like if anything you would think that the mis would have you know got greater margins because you can see so much better you're able to take the margins out further more lateral um, and I know there were two things in the paper they said, and, and Dr. Uh, Leanne was talking about them earlier. So the two were the use of a manipulator um, and the CO2. So how do we think the manipulator may, may cause an issue with this? They suspect that it causes increased tumor spillage. How so? I mean, does that, does that make sense? It doesn't really make sense to me unless you perforate 
Well, you're placing it potentially, but... I had a hard time buying that because the stages of disease you're dealing with in these cases are microscopic. Mm. And so if they're not in the canal of the cervix, you should have no contact with the disease in placing a manipulator. Yeah, I mean, it's not like you're... I don't know, it's like you're doing a uh, saline sonogram where you're like pushing fluid through the uterus out the fallopian tubes yeah. and like, you know, maybe something like that. But you're just putting something that's just sitting there. Maybe you put a balloon in there so it holds it in place. But it really shouldn't be like, you know, pushing things out of the uterus. I thought that was a little bit weird. Um, and the other one they mentioned is CO2. And Dr. Leanne, I don't know, you're the one who mentioned that. So why did you think they think that CO2 may be an issue? I mean, maybe that by, you know, by the constant flow of CO2 gas into the abdomen, maybe that's potentially seeding microscopic particles. That's maybe that's what they're thinking. Now, maybe you could take that back to your energy discussion. And is there some aerosolization of of disease cells while you're coagulating such that then the insufflation takes that around the belly? I mean, I think you could combine those two thoughts. Yeah, I mean, that would make sense with the non-vault recurrences, right? So in open, all the recurrences are happening where the cancer was, right? The Right. The vault is, you know, what you cut through Which in order sense. to take the cervix out. So at least that's like adjacent. So it makes sense that maybe there was some residual disease there that you didn't catch or, or, or something. But the non-vault stuff is the stuff that's interesting. And I think, I think that's absolutely... I shouldn't say it's absolutely right. It, it starts to make some intuitive sense that maybe some combination of CO2 with the vaporization of the cells by using our energy devices is is causing to that seeding. Now, that is starting to make a little bit of sense to me. And, and if that is the case, there's nothing we can do about this, right? There's not going to be any surgical technique that we're going to be able to use to overcome this unless we can somehow come up with a way to cold clamp the... Um, our, our specimens, right? But we don't have any way of doing anything cold uh, in the, the belly laparoscopically. It's not going to cause massive bleeding. Not without tying. <laughs> right. Um, so I guess, I mean, you could do tying. You could do some kind of interesting, um, you know, knot tying, uh, extracorporeal knot tying maybe. Um, but that's, I don't know, that's getting a little far-fetched. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that's going to be possible. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, uh, to be fair... They, I'm sure they felt compelled to put out some possible explanations as to why there was a difference. Um, and they're not in any position to know anything different than we are about why, right? So all they're doing is throwing out possible ideas, and that's what we're doing on, on this uh, show as well. So, um, But they, they had to do it. You, you can't submit a paper like this and not come up with a couple of reasons as to potentially why, which is probably why the manipulator was in there and doesn't really make too much sense. So I don't blame them for that. <laughs> So I think they do mention in this article too that um, I, that I, in studies looking at um, uh, MIS versus open approach for the treatment of endometrial cancer, they haven't found s- the similar results. And to me, thinking you know, they're we're using the same instruments and same technology. Why is why is the results different for cervical cancer than endometrial cancer? I mean, you could have a thought if they didn't include adenocarcinoma in this paper, but they did. Mm-hmm. I mean, because then you could go with, you know, perhaps squamous truly is different than adeno, but they included adeno in this group. And so I f- fail to find a reason yet. I mean, the only thing I can think of is that most of your endometrial cancers that you're doing, especially laparoscopically, robotically, are going to be your early stage endometrial cancers confined to the endometrium, maybe into the That's myometrium true. somewhat, but you're not cutting through the myometrium when you do your surgery. Um, and not necessarily that we're cutting through the cervix when we do the radical hysterectomy either, but we're much closer to it. Dr. Blaber's not buying it. I'm not because we're still dealing with 1A1 to 1B1 cervical cancer. That's not... These are true. Really maybe small maybe lesions. going back to what I said earlier, maybe it goes back to lymphovascular space invasion. And do those two cancers behave differently when it comes to that? I mean, I think they do. Yeah. I mean, again, none of the three of us are oncologists, so we're not going to answer all the questions tonight. Um, So 
let's take this paper uh, on face value. Um, and as Dr. Blaber said earlier, there is already undergoing a, a sea change in cervical cancer treatment based on this paper. And I think understandably so. I think as a, ethically, we have an obligation to go back to the surgery we know is better until we figure out either why or someone else disproves the study. But right now, I think it's it would be ethically difficult to offer these women um, minimally invasive radical hysterectomy. I don't know if the two of you feel differently. I don't. I just also find that a little disconcerting. I think it's the right thing, but it bothers me a little because if women aren't being offered this surgery, then we might not ever be able to study this further and learn the answers to our outstanding questions. I think there's a difference between offering it as research and offering it as, I don't want to say standard of care, but offering it as a standard of care. Those are two different things. I think it will be a hard sell, considering that this is already a paper, you know, less than two weeks after it's been published, that's hit the national news. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that in our field especially, um, it's hard to get away with continuing these practices when a paper like this comes out. Right. Like, so the three of us have been through this before. Like, this is not new to us, right? So, I don't know, how many years ago was it now? Five years ago? Um, something like that, right? Yeah, five. Yeah, yeah, four or five years ago, the the whole uh, hoopla came up around morselating uh, uteruses and fibroids for the risk of spreading leiomyosarcoma. And there were people during that time who basically said that, you know, GYN MIS is dead. Like, we're never going to be able to do it again because now we can't morselate... Um, and how can we do it if we can't morselate? I mean, we can do tiny uteruses, but we can't do anything that's lar too large. It can't fit through the uh, vagina. Uh, and yet here we are five years later, and I would say that MIS, uh, GYN surgery, has only grown since then. Right? We had to adjust our practices, um, but, it, but we did, you know, it didn't end us. Mm -hmm. Now, I think it's a little bit different because I don't know how you get around this particular issue. I mean, for ours, we just learned how to morselate inside a bag. Um, and there are uh, many different ways of doing that. Um, but for this, I'm, I'm not sure what the, how they're going to get around it, but I, I wouldn't count it down yet. Okay. Like, we, we've survived one of these already. I don't know. So, I guess my last question for the two of you is, we're going to have women who don't have cervical cancer, Right, but they're going to look at minimally invasive versus open surgery. They're going to do a Google search, and this paper is going to come up. Mm -hmm. Right, and they're going to come in and say, "Well, I just saw this paper that says that God forbid I have cancer, this is going to kill me." Well, they're going to Google this, and the CNN commentary on this paper is going to come up. <laughs> well, you're right there. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you, you two especially, uh, are going to see these women who come in, and they're going to ask you this question, uh, Doctor Leanne. How are you going to address this with them? Well, I would say, you know, um, as a doctor, having done my due diligence, I would reassure them that through our preoperative workup, you know, she um, does not have cervical cancer or endometrial cancer, and that I would review the pros and cons of open versus laparoscopic surgery with her. And I think for my practice, um, I would still recommend um, minimally invasive approaches for benign conditions. How about for someone who maybe has an abnormal pap smear, a copo says CIN1, CIN2, um, and you're going to do a TLH for these, this woman, which is appropriate. You're not going to leave the cervix. Is there any different conversation you might have there? I don't think so. No. Because I still wouldn't be offering the patient a radical. Okay. Because going into that surgery, I'd still be offering them True. a routine total laparoscopic hysterectomy. Right. I mean, sure, but now you're coming even closer to the cervix. You would offer them a regular run-of-the-mill abdominal hysterectomy as well. Okay. S stick a pin in that for one second because I have – this is one of my, my pet projects recently. But, I mean, would you do anything differently? Would you do like a, a, a leap or a cone first before you said that you were going to do this hysterectomy if she has CIN1 or something? I mean – Wait, is it going to change anything? It looks like the two of you are saying no. No, because um, I adhere to the ASCCP guidelines. Okay. 
Fair enough. No. Okay. All right. I'll take it. Just, you know, asking questions. Although I wonder how this will contribute to their discussions in the future. Fair. Or like with the the NCCN guidelines recommendations, right? Because right, right now they say you could do open or um, MIS. Yeah, I assume those will change soon based on this. So going back to what you said, um, I have on this podcast and, and personally in discussions been talking a lot about informed consent recently. Um, because the more and more I think about it, the more I think it's bullshit. And not that we shouldn't inform our patients of the risks and benefits, but to ask somebody who doesn't have a training in medicine to really appreciate the pros and the cons of anything and come up with their own decision, I think is asking too much for people. Um, and so the last thing, cause you guys do this, the two of you do this on a daily basis, right? You see women who have a large fibroid uterus or whatever it may be, and you are going to give them the pros and cons of laparoscopic versus open versus vaginal hysterectomy. And then, so I guess I want to hear, how do the two of you approach this? And we'll start with Dr. Leanne. Like, what does your counseling look like? And do you try to make a directive or is it completely non-directive for your patients? I think I veer towards um, giving them all the options in the beginning, whether it's medical versus surgical, and then surgical, the different approaches. But I do t- try to, you know, as I'm um, um, summarizing at the end, do make it more directive to make, to make it easier for the patient. Because a lot of times after I've gone through the whole rigmarole, patients will stare at me blankly and or say, you know, do what you think is best. So I definitely try to tailor my um, my recommendations to be more directive. I, w- I would say that that's exactly how I approach it. Uh, almost like a, a big umbrella. I go over all the options very generally. And then as I get to the ones that I think are better suited for the patient, I'll get more detailed about those. And as I conclude my discussion of options, I really do focus on the ones that I think are the best options. And so, yes, I get very directive in the end. So do you actually use words like, I recommend this? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, I mean, it's, I wouldn't say I would recommend only one option. I'd probably say these are the, you know, two or three that I would recommend. And it's really, um, and then up to the patient, what she'd like to do. So I'll say I would recommend a hysterectomy. Like if we're having a fibroid discussion and we've gotten to the surgical options and we're talking about myomectomy versus hysterectomy, if this is a patient who's done with childbearing, I say that in a patient done with childbearing, I recommend a hysterectomy. But do you recommend a root? And then we'll discuss those roots and I say, you know, based on my training, I would recommend that you have a laparoscopic hysterectomy. It isn't the only way to do this. However, that is what I do. And so I would recommend this. If I truly think this is a patient who's a great candidate for another modality, like let's say a vaginal hiss, let's say their uterus really isn't that impressively big, then I'll say, you know, I do this, but you really do seem like a good candidate for this surgery. And if you'd like to hear more about that, I can refer you here. And so I I tend to be directive, but also I, I'm open to the fact that I don't necessarily do all the things that are best for patients. And so I'm happy to refer them elsewhere if they need that. Okay. I mean, fair enough. I and mean, it's basically what I do as well. I've just been thinking, you know, more about this because, uh, you know, I, I, there's like a lot of patient autonomy, obviously. You want them to be informed, but they also most people want you to tell them what you think they should do. Yes. Right. Uh, like you're going to a lawyer or accountant or anyone else. Like I want the accountant to tell me what he, what they think is best. Right. Um, at the same time, I have a problem with that. Maybe a societal where I can say, you know, I recommend, I just did the problem the other day. I recommend a vacuum for you, but we can also do a C-section and here are the risks and benefits. Um, and this woman chose a C-section, which was fine, because obviously if I'm going to get sued about something, it's going to be over a vacuum, not over a C-section. But like, how much, at the end of the day, if I recommend something and the patient agrees with that recommendation and chooses it, how much am I responsible for that choice? Right? Because she chose it, but I did recommend it. Right? So, I don't know. We, I start to get into like some, I don't know if ethical is the right word, um, but certainly some legal um, concerns there is, you know, how much of that is my, I don't want to use the word fault, but how much of that is my fault? Um, if there is a complication doing laparoscopy, I'm the one who recommended that. 
Yes and no. I mean, that's why I do a very thorough risks discussion as well after I recommend something. Um, because I also think that then, you know, they're not surprised. It's not the right. first time they're hearing of it when you tell them that, you know, you've transected their ureter. Like, this is something you discussed. Right. Um, right. I, would, I would never want to feel that if, you know, if a complication happened that I talked the patient into it and I didn't give her all the other options that um, that she should have been aware about. So that's why I think I definitely give a very broad, as Dr. Blaber said, umbrella view of her options, but then I do tailor my counseling. And then in the end, if she chooses that, then I feel that I've, we've had a good discussion. Yeah. I think we're all on the same page. I just, I'm having a, one of those moments in my life where I'm having a difficulty for myself saying what's the difference between a recommendation versus directing someone to the, what I want them to do. Um, and I know that sounds almost like the same thing, but in my head it's not. Um, and I don't, and I'm trying to figure out where that line is for me. Like how, how much do I vigorously recommend something? Um, I don't know. I'm not going to answer it tonight, but it's something I've been thinking about more and you two are the perfect people to, uh, to discuss it with. So thank you for indulging me. Um, so I guess we'll finish up this paper. I mean, it, from a journal club point of view, uh, this was a kind of a perfect paper. Um, they had a nice primary objective. They had good secondary objectives. Um, there were no composite outcomes, um, thankfully. Um, they, I mean, we could talk about having 33 sites, but I think they really did their best to, um, you know, control for that. The, the study design was good. Um, their write-up is fantastic. I mean, it's a New England journal. They don't really accept anything that's not written very well, but the, the write-up was fantastic. Um, and their discussion, I thought, was was good. Their limitations, all that stuff. Um, so it's a good paper to read. I'll put it in the show notes. I encourage you all to read it just if you're interested in, in literature. It's good. Um, but I really enjoyed, and, and thanks to the two of you, the discussion more about how this affects everyone in the minimally invasive world and not just the oncologists. Um, so I wanted to thank the, the two of you for that again. Any final thoughts about the paper um, before we wrap up, Dr. Blaber? Uh, like you said, great paper. Um, still a little disappointed, but uh, but it is a great paper. Fair enough. Yeah, I agree. It was a great paper, really um, well-written, concise, um, and really, yeah, like, starting when I first started to read it, I thought it was going to, you know, show again that MIS was superior or was not inferior, but yeah, my world was kind of turned upside down a little bit. That's good. I mean, again, going back to what I said in the beginning, um, I like to look at the things that we accept as truth, right? MIS is better, right? Right. That's what we've been living as the world for 15, 20 years. We've all lived in this world that MIS is better. Um, and every once in a while, it's nice to be kicked in the face and told that maybe what we assume to be true is not. Um, and I actually encourage everyone, I tell this all the time in my medical student lectures, is don't assume that what anyone tells you is right. Go look it up and find out if it actually is. Because a lot of times you're going to find out that there's actually no data to support that it's true. And I always say that for MIS... Um, we don't have a ton of data that supports what we do as far as it being better outcomes, um, especially not in the world of oncology, although there, there is some stuff. Um, so anyway, I appreciate this paper. I'm glad it was published, and I want to thank the two of you for joining me. So thank you, Dr. Blaber, for spending some time with us tonight. Thank you for having me again. And Dr. Leanne, thank you so much for being here as well. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And thank you all for listening. Like I said earlier, if you do enjoy the show and you want to contribute, please go to www.obgyn.fm, hit the support link and contribute and, and keep this going. Maybe help us get some transcripts up. Um, in the meantime, thanks for listening and we'll be back again soon with a new episode. <laughs>